Hello everyone, and welcome to the Quorum Podcast. This is where academic medicine meets remote, austere, and resource-limited areas. So welcome back to the program. My name is Averco Kelly. This week, we are with Nick Dillon. Nick taught on our programs way back when in, in Pretty Bay and Malta, and you are currently are finishing up being a country manager for Icarus. Nick, welcome to the Quorum Podcast. Cheers, April. We were saying before, it's, it's been a minute. Good to be back and, uh, and catch up in the chat. Yeah, we keep missing each other. Uh, things that you're doing are conferences and, and, and you're not uh, the one, going to the ones I am. So, man, we, we definitely need to catch up and have a point. Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell us about yourself. Who, who are you, your background, uh, what you've been doing? So, um, currently up until effectively today, so I was um, position as global operations manager for ICRIS. Um, and then I've on the back of that, I've been around the block a couple of times. So being a contracting medic for, uh, must be pushing probably about 18 years now. So again, that's been sort of full time. Mm. What is your profession stuff? Um, working uh, within the remote medical industry. Uh, so I cut my teeth out many, many years ago. Um, went off and uh, initially left the military, then went off and did uh, you know the old Ronin uh, ambulance technician program. Uh, and then from there, that's sort of set me in a pathway of everything from done that. The civilian expedition, I've been very lucky in my career to, to, to do quite a few different things, everything from the civilian expedition route, commercial, hostile, um, security, offshore, onshore, um, supporting a, a huge amount of different, different aspects, um, high altitude, um, across the board. Um, you know, you get that that's the benefit of being, of being a contractor. And so I've took full advantage of it for, for quite some time. Um, and as well as that, um, also followed it up with a, with a fair bit of teaching, um, and so the academic side as well. So I've been, I've been very lucky in my career to have pretty much done most things that you can do right there, um, in one variation or another, often not, not the best, but I've certainly got, got around the place, um, and had the privilege of working with some, some great people and some really interesting places, um, uh, around the world with some really good organizations as well. And so that's fallen into sort of my progression within the industry now, I suppose, as well. So yeah, I've been around. Yeah, you, you've got your fingers in a lot of pies. Yeah, some some pretty hot and pretty. You, pull, you want to pull your finger out pretty quick. Uh, and others, nice tasty ones. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's been lucky. So there's not much that sort of, um, I haven't done, and yeah, you know, and I still try and you know pass that on to. I still teach at, at university level. Um, and then we were just talking about there, like throughout my career, I've always valued the education side. Um, so I was one of, one of the first sort of paramedics to go through the old advanced practitioner program. Um, so in university, my master's mm. in advanced practice, um, then followed that up with a postgraduate um, diploma through Queen's in uh, Queen Mary's in uh, emergency and resuscitation medicine, which is really good. Um, and that gave me a lot of the advanced practice was a nursing qualification. So working at a postgraduate level, the rest of the cohort was all nurses. So really getting that side of filling out that side of the background and then the um, postgrad in emergency medicine, um, that is an open open platform for paramedics, doctors and nurses, for medical professionals. So again, seeing the, the, other, the other side of the coin and, and working in that multidisciplinary and educating um, in a multidisciplinary environment. And then moving on to my sort of career, I've, I've managed um, not just sort of paramedic projects, um, example being Ukraine, managed the biggest paramedic project in the world actually out there. I think at that point, we had something like at some point 50 odd lads out there um, supporting diplomatic missions, but then also um, just in the in the day to day aspect, managing projects as doctors, nurses, lab techs, radiologists, and and those things. Both at, within clinics, um, I ran multiple clinics over in Iraq, um, hospitals, uh, and then working in, in Icarus as well, and on the regional and global level, um, running and, and managing the day to days and weeks to weeks of, of, of quite a broad spectrum of, of, of stuff, everything from helicopters to um, surgical teams to you know single paramedic in a bag and that traditional sort of remote medic rapid deployment option as well so yeah i've been very lucky in what, what i've done and um and, and what i've experienced across, across the way really um which i'm uh, hugely appreciative for. so you you've done a tremendous amount within the, the remote medicine community but also as a master's level acp advanced clinical practice you're you're at the junior doctor level aren't you yeah i mean that was a really good experience so working in uh so we knew that you go into your placements so I did my placement in the UK, uh, working at A&E there um, for a couple of weeks. 
And that was really interesting, um, working with other advanced practitioners who came from both uh, paramedic backgrounds and nursing backgrounds. And then once you get to ACP level, you lose your original call sign, effectively. You know, you take off that rank slide and you know, that unit tab, you put on, put on your ACP hat. Um, mm. So it's really interesting seeing how the different professions approach that um, and having that ability to treat and release, which to be fair, aligns much more with the remote medical scope of practice. Um, and it's something I've always said throughout my career. I cut my teeth on the rigs, did the hard yards in the North Sea. Um, and out there, you know, I was a 20 year old medic with 20 year old medics experience. And I was the only medical professional for, you know, 300 odd, odd people sitting out in the middle of the North Sea. Um, so in that, that, that scope of practice is very much more aligned now, which what would be an advanced clinical practitioner role and that ability to do an advanced assessment and that, that critical thinking that backs it up. Um, so yeah, it was a really, really good thing to do. And I certainly would advise people to go down that route. It is, it is a very rewarding um, uh, qualification to study and, and really pushes your practice to certain new levels and gives you a confidence in your remote environment and also your employer. You know? Obviously now mm. coming from the commercial side, when I'm looking to hire people, that would always stand out. So how has your your earning your ACP influenced your remote practice? I think it just gives you more critical, the ability to critically think, to critically assess a patient. You understand, you can speak the language. So when you're working with an A, uh, you know, a multidiscipline clinical environment, you're enabled to do a advanced um, clinical assessment, physical assessment of a patient. It gives you the frameworks you can build on. Now, it's training, so you put your own on it. Same when you do your paramedic training, you're given a framework and you put the meat on the bones, you get some tools to work with and, and you, you apply them as needed. But certainly for me, it gave me a level of academic rigor and, uh, and the concept of evidence-based medicine that I knew when I was faced with a problem, I could critically assess it, move through it, find an evidence base, a treatment pathway, understand you know, what my limits were as well, I think um and, and and push on so it certainly helped my practice um a great deal both independently and also working with um, other medical professionals because i could speak nurse mm. i could speak doctor you know I, I had a level of that common knowledge that is outside of just your unit you know paramedics can speak paramedic to each other but everyone else looks at you and tries you know what's wrong with that look um <laughs> you know, yeah. whereas it gives you that professionalism that you can you can you can approach problems in the same manner we're all on the same page um, so I think it was a, it was a great, great um, thing, particularly then to follow up with the postgraduate, whereas ACP is very much more frameworks and the way you think. Um, I find that then uh, following that up with a postgraduate in emergency resuscitation medicine was very much more clinically focused. So it added some meat to the frameworks of thought. So whereas ACP was how you approach a problem and troubleshooting it and, and, and that aspect and certainly the academic side stronger. My um my follow up in, in emergency medicine was clinically focused and it and it went very much down at that you know, subcellular level of treatment and you know they always talk about mm. you know, aim small miss small what I learned from from that follow up is like you know start looking at instead of resuscitating you know um, organs or systems you know you start resuscitating intracellular you know you say okay how can I resuscitate the mitochondria of this patient and that everything else leads on from there. Um, and, and that was something that I really got. And that's the level you understand the level that good clinical, clinical doctors think at. Um, and that really influenced the way that I approach problems and, and my treatment pathways and my broader understanding that helps. I was understanding what was happening two or three levels above me. So then when I went on to managing an assistance level, I could understand, okay, this consultant orthopedic wants this. I know why. Um, and that sort of helped, certainly helped me in my career um, following on from when I sort of stepped out of the hands-on clinical role. The Masters in ACP taught you how to think differently as from, from a paramedic level. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, and the, the framework which to build things on, how you approach a problem, like that critical thinking aspect. Um, and also the academics, you know, how to read a paper, um, how you read an evidence base, where evidence comes from, what is quality evidence. You know, what's the difference between someone putting something on Facebook and something being in the Cochrane Review? You know, mm. um, and I think particularly, and this is pre-COVID, particularly in the modern era where there's social media and there's all these different bits and everyone's an expert. I think that was a, was a huge benefit. I think even now is 
okay, looking at looking at what is the best best pathway for this patient. How do I find that? So the Masters ACP now has a pathway from ACP to MBBS. Have you thought about becoming a doctor? No, I work for living me. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I think the uh, I I still keep my hands in clinical, but my I'm now in the, the I for me the I suppose it's looking at I really enjoy patient interactions, um, which is great. But you're always quite limited into I can treat if you're in front of me, I can treat you really well. Yeah, then that's go that's that's great. Whereas I think now my career has moved on and my sort of passion has moved on to more the organizational systems where you can impact at population level. You know, when you when you put in a good process and a good medical system where you augment something that is there and more enhance a, a failing system or improve it, uh, you can even though you're not actually treating that patient, you can create an environment where um, you can you can really nudge population markets uh, at, a, at a bigger scale. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's where my pathway is going. Um, I toyed with a public health as well, so I did the first year of the um, uh, MPH, but it got a bit got a bit expensive for my taste at that point in time. As contractors, you get good times and bad times, mm. so I had to. I did one year of that, but I enjoyed that, and that really helped me. So I did statistics and epididymology. Oh, the hard good stuff. Good luck trying to spell yeah. that one. Yeah, yeah. So um, I passed it just, um, but I found that really, really good. And that's something that is ironically stood me very, very well is having an understanding of epididymology and um, statistics at, at that level, because again, it enables you to, to read the detail, the so what from the numbers and papers and the literature that comes out. Um, so again, it's it's not the cool guy stuff, you know. It's the it's the Sydney books and nerd out stuff. But for me, that that makes a difference. That's what's allowed me to, to go on in my career mm. and, and put the time into the academics. Um, I think and don't keep getting distracted by uh, underwater knife fighting and <laughs> hang off the back of helicopter courses, which we all like to do. Let's face mm. it. Um, but my advice would be do the, do, do the nerdy stuff and then people will invite you on to those courses for free, to be honest. Mm. Is that why you're doing the MBA? You're, you're looking at systemic influences? Yes, yeah, so I'm in the final year of MBA and it's focused on risk and resilience. Um, and resilience within so health and infrastructure is, you know, is crucial. And as COVID's stress tested pretty much everything, I mean, particularly um, um, be it remote or, or elsewhere, even national infrastructures, I mean, there's been a lot more focus on, on, on that in every aspect. Um, so it's certainly something that's, that's where I've sort of moved on to finish up on that. Um, and also career prospects wise, again, it, it adds a different dimension. You know, you've got mm. the field. If you have the field experience, you've got the medical academics. You know, regardless how you want to do it, you need a resilient way to make money from it. So, when are you going to do your doctorate? Uh, people keep asking me that. Eh? <laughs> when I have spare time. Um, but yeah, I look. I do stuff because I'm interested in. It's not a particularly. You know, uh, I don't do it for the names. I just generally like learning things, um, which is which is helpful. True. Um, but certainly, I think it's. And that, that to me is the key to, to remote medicine is you have to be a jack of all trades. You know, when I'm putting people, mm. and I've seen it from, from managing people now, when I'm looking for someone to run something somewhere, you know, it's very rare that, to be fair, that's why a lot of project managers are paramedics because you tend to be a bit more open and they have an a alternative skill set. You know, it's not, you, you're a bit of a Swiss Army knife. Um, you can't just go out and, most of the challenges you get in remote environments aren't clinical, to be honest. You know, most mm. of them are logistical. Most of them are, um, you know, how do I get my power source to, to not blow up all of my posh ECG machines? <laughs> you know, really, that genu- yeah. genuinely is one of the biggest problems we face, like internationally, is like, how do you use dirty power? You know, logistics chain. How do you mm. get stuff, cold chain, from where, you, where it lands there? The medicine is the easy bit. It's the supporting structures that come with that. And that requires a more organizational mindset. It's not just clinical. You know, the, the, the real strength in, in being a good remote medic is looking, especially private sets, looking at the client, understanding the contract, looking at what the client wants to get from you and what is their output, what are you actually supporting. In oil and gas, it's continued production. If you can support the barrels per day requirement of the, of the site by keeping people at work, everybody's happy. Um, yeah, so effectively, mm. therefore, or it could be safety outputs. You know, if it's in a public health or epidemiological crisis, then it's okay. 
public safety and you're looking at trying to reduce infection rates you know, it's understanding what what, what you're there for um, it's, and that, that's what a good remote medic does not just the clinical aspect so nick you and i met at Bewley's restaurant in grafton street in dublin is that right sounds about right three many moons or was it the red cow inn i don't remember which Uh, it was ages ago what 2009 i believe something like that is yeah and then we often did battles at some point so that was because we were still working out of in uh i don't know wicklow i think it was wasn't it um yeah so no you came to killarney to teach for us and then uh wexford as well was it or just killarney wexford as well yeah Right on the beach. Yeah, we did the Myra course on the beach and then Malta. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And I'd forgotten you taught on the battles uh, when we were doing DMI, was it? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I taught on the battles course for that as well. That's where I met Winston and, and the various others. So how was your experience teaching in Ireland? You're Irish or you were living in Ireland at the time. And how was your experience with that? I, I really enjoyed it. I think there's a lot of, I mean, not in benefits just from the countryside. Is that there's a lot of wilderness stuff and, and, and things like that. Um, so I mean, the people were really, the students were very receptive. Um, you know, there's certainly some star students come out of those courses that went on their careers. I'm thinking about, you know, guys like Connie went on, um, continued their medical careers. Um, I think there was a good, Ireland got a lot of, surprisingly, quite a, a, a good amount of ex-military as well going around. You want to continue their skill sets internationally. Mm. Um, so, yeah, you know, I really enjoyed it there. It's particularly, I mean, Kalani and you've got the greenery, the forests, the, the outdoor adventure side of things. Um, it's a different sort of remote medicine. It was very much more wilderness medicine, that that, that subsection, mm. um, which is really good fun to teach because everyone has a, people come with a passion for the wilderness and now they're looking to enhance their skill sets and push it out there, you know. Um, so I know I really enjoyed 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 uh, out there, and just the locations are great, the facilities are great out there. You know, and after teaching all over the world, it's still you know it was still really good courses at that level because you you it's far easier to teach somebody at, at a lower level because you have such a higher impact on their skill set. Mm. Literally, you can go with somebody literally knowing nothing, and then the end of first day one, they can do a recess. You know, I think that's something that's you know it's um, hugely impactful in what you can teach someone at that level in the lower level courses and i use that with the utmost respect that term you know whereas you, when you go on to sort of the, the 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 more advanced courses you know you're talking about percentile changes in skill set whereas when teaching someone bls they've gone from go nothing to actually be able to do to do a resuscitation which is huge mm. you know zero to hero completely completely I enjoyed the Irish courses because of the passion that we saw in, in these people. They would come in for maybe a two-day woofa, and it wasn't enough, so they, they were, wanted more and more and more, and that's why we started the, the REMT. You were a very big part of yeah. starting the, our remote EMT and, and taught on that. And then the Myra, of course, with, with XMED. And- yeah, I mean, I, my main purpose was I couldn't say woofer anymore in class without cracking up, so <laughs> we had to put it somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> we did indeed. We did indeed. And then we brought you down to Pretty Bay, Malta, and tell us your experiences working there in, in, in Pretty Bay. Yeah, it was really, I think, I think the simply industry paramedic course was, um, was in the context of it. It was one of the, the first of its sort of kind in the fact of what it was doing, and it was recognizing its medicine for a purpose. You know, as I kind of spoke, referenced some previous sort of comments about, like, okay, what you're there for as a remote medic. Um, the industry of, of remote medicine and it was booming in those days as well eh? mm. when we had offshore oil and gas and exploration it was really booming industry and i think it, the purpose of that course was, was right and what it was it gave a pathway um to individuals with the understanding that some people want to qualify as a medic but not work in an ambulance system or in that country you know and i think it really highlighted what is a what is a, a ability of skill set versus a license um, and, and looking towards giving people the opportunity to, to actually get that skill set mm. um, and, and improve themselves and, and recognizing the need for that within the broader industry. And not many people were doing the higher level courses at that point. No, it was quite a, to teach um, pre-hospital at, at a paramedic independent practitioner level is, you know, not many people do that mm. for good reason because it is very resource heavy um you know you need to know what you're talking about 
um, and particularly with the added bits of a remote environment where you're not sure what drugs these guys are going to have and girls are going to have when they go out there. Yeah. You know, you, I've, you know, we've all worked in stuff where you tip up and you go, okay, what I got today, what piece of equipment, you know, what algorithm are you going to use? What, you know, it's a, it's a huge amount of unknown. So to prepare people to have the, the, the critical thinking skills and the, and the acumen and the understanding at the very, very basics to be able to, to build on that and deliver a deliver effect in country with who knows what they're going to have or where they are. Um, it was really, really interesting, really good challenge. Um, I think we did it very well. I mean, it's, that's why the course is still obviously running and mm. it's, it's escalated now to sort of, to get the, the academic recognition that you see across the industry as well. Yeah. Um, and we still have people coming in with, you know, I've, people who have come in and transitioned to, to, to registration um, and, you know, I've employed them because you know what you're going to get. And you were the one that came up with the name industry paramedic. This is all you, mate. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't pin it all on me, eh, Rick? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think, it, but I think that, that was that was off the back of my experience. Like, is there was an industry? I don't think it was, and it was outside. Everyone was focused on wilderness. It was, it doesn't you, you know tying a stick to someone's leg with the greatest respect is not good mm. medicine. You know that you acknowledge it. It's the best you can do at the time. But there was a niche of medicine that was look. We we're in the wilderness, but we we have. A actual capability we can build in and there's money behind us and resources so you know we have a, a level of resources that is above none so how do we best make the most of that it's limited but it's there and i think that that was that was the focus wasn't it it is that that's my passion to find the the best evidence-based medicine for that environment so it's not wilderness bunch of sticks and rocks and things like that it is you're, you're on a rig or, or you're um, in, in the Himalayas, like we're going to talk about with yourself in a bit. And you, you do have a kit in your SUV. It's not just working out of a, a bum bag. It's, you, you have, uh, ultrasound, you have, um, telemedicine, you, 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 you've got ALS level stuff. And this is what we've been trying to teach. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, and as technology has come along, it's aiding that. I think it's going to be a big change as well. I think AI is going to have a huge impact, yeah. um, in that, in, in increasing the capabilities, um, you know, I still think there's a level of it being like telemedicine, like phone a friend. There's a level of being stuck in the in the 70s with it. Um, I think there's going to be huge advances in that now. I mean, I work closely with um, multinational and supranational organizations in my current role, and you can see this is the problem. It's like how do you how do you deliver care to these places? Mm. You know, and we spoke about the problems of logistics and power and all this sort of stuff. Is how do you make the most of what you've got? Um, in these in these areas, um, and yeah, you know, that's 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 a problem that I think is going to get a lot more. And that there's there's levels of normal um, hospital infrastructure and state level infrastructure that can really learn a bit from the way that remote medicine has been done in the past. You know how you how you leverage your resources to have the most effect for the most people. Um, how you plan. I think mean, as a lot of it has always come in. I always remember the planning lectures. It was my big thing. Soup sacks end up being an operations officer, but um, ops manager. But you know, how do you how do you plan? What do you need? This is a question I get from clients. Okay, I'm going here. What do I need? You know, probably not a CT machine. You can make an argument for it, but you ain't going to get one. Mm. You know, and then looking at okay, what is the clinical risk, and then how do you make that cost effective, and how do you balance cost requirement environment? Um, and put all of that together and create a solution that has a has an actual real impact um, on the on the welfare and the well being of, of the, the population at risk. Um, mm. And that's the challenge. That's where remote medicine is interesting um, because you can get into the weeds on that. What I what I like about remote medicine versus wilderness medicine, we we embrace technology. We so you, you talk about int- introducing CT scans. I mean that that's mental for for a lot of remote. Uh, uh, I, I saw a, a CT scan in the middle of Africa, and it was holding a door open because somebody donated the CT scanner. No one knew how to use it. No one had the money to run it. No one had to fix it, and it's just sitting there rusting. So I mean, it's, the technology is is definitely. Uh, important for remote medicine with with a limit and and you mentioned ai and i think remote medicine austere medicine needs to embrace ai because within i'd say this time next year we're going to have a a smartphone with standalone ai that we could put on audio whilst we're working with this guy and say hey i got these are the symptoms and ai is like well this is you can have this this and this do this rdt this so you're you're basically going to have an ai partner yeah, for sure. It's going to be like a copo. So, I mean, this is something that I, 
I ended up having my in between everything else, I ended up doing my own uh, med tech startup for a bit, um, focused on this. And the, the problem I realized I was in Tanzania um, on a job. And uh, one of the things there's a large oil and gas company, and the oil and gas, I mean, you can say what you want about it, but they really do have a huge impact in the areas they go work in. They basically got uh, health insurance for the entire population in this area in, in real middle of nowhere Tanzania. And I went in and they wanted to look at, I'm introducing a new ICU capability in the hospital. So I went in to do a bit of kick some tires, big regional hospital, kick some tires, see what's going on. Looked around and uh, I was pretty grim. And, um, you know, looking at said, well, all right, where's your, uh, where's your machines that go ping? And because of what you mean, because like regional hospitals, like didn't see a single ECG. And I was like, right, and wow. we're looking to spend, they were looking to spend tens of millions. Imagine an ICU with all the machines that go ping and the dancing stuff. So I was like, right, well, they go, well, we've got one ECG and it's only be used by the hospital director. I was like, right, so this thing is literally, it's a witness office and it's a coffee holder and it gets wheeled out <laughs> when the president comes in. It gets plugged in. And again, this is nothing against, this is, this is the reality of, you know, it's nothing against doctors who are doing amazing work with what they had, but their exposure. I mean, how many easy ECG books are written in Swahili? You tell me that. Mm, zero. You know I mean, like, realistically, and so... You, you, they're not exposed to it. So these are really good, smart, intelligent, hugely capable professionals, but it's not exposed to the stuff that we count as a normal bit for various reasons, cultural, probably of all sudden you can get this whole other thing going on. So it's right, well, you've got these people who are willing and able, but, you know, what can you do about it? And then I was in running uh, multiple clinics in Iraq. And I was, I had, uh, it was a good setup. We had ambulance for um, another large oil and gas company. And, uh, we had um, a call center for ambulance responses, about five hospitals around the place. And uh, the guys who were there wanted to learn. I was teaching ACLS. So, right, we want to learn ACLS. And I, I was there at night. And if there was a response, they, they could help me out. So grand. So these guys, smart blokes, um, taught them ACLS to sit the straight up AHA ACLS exam. The problem I was having is that they knew the algorithms and they knew what, what they needed to do, but they couldn't read the squiggly lines on the machine. When you think about it, like, you know, ECG, that hasn't changed. Why is it green? Why well, we've got a squiggly line? It's ridiculous. You know what I mean? Like mm. as far as decision support. So I end up putting in and, and creating a, a, a process where um, much like an AED is augmented, what was the, the remit of a cardiothoracic surgeon in the 70s, now a Boy Scout can press go and you can shock a heart. And that's purely mm. because it's decision support and interface. So I started putting that in and looking at how just through simple overarching interface, you can suddenly upskill the population. So, you know, the doctor, you've got these doctors in Tanzania, hugely skilled, but they're not exposed to, to any of the machinery. Well, how can we allow them to do what they know what they need to do? They just don't know how to operate the machine that's there to do it. Which is ironic because the machine's costing 25 grand, yet only 1% of the population can turn the knobs on it to do something with it which mm. seems absolutely ridiculous to me. So it was looking at how we can actually put that and just using simple interfaces, make technology more accessible rather than making technology more complex and complicated and making less and less people able to use it to have clinical effect. How can we dumb down technology? Again, not against the user, but just simplify it so that anybody can suddenly start using this technology. Why can't an ECG just say shockable rhythm? It knows. Mm. Why do we need to have a squiggly line? I think that that's going to be the future where I comes into it. It's going to bridge that interface where it's suddenly going to make all this technology and the medical concepts much more achievable. And it's going to bridge the, the previous gap between so that, that knowledge um, failure that's happening between these skilled people, people who are willing, able to support and save lives in these areas, but we're just not providing them with the tools or we're, we're putting barriers in place. So they can't use the tools that everyone else has to do it. Like that that's where we're going to see the biggest impact i think in democratizing medical technology um i think that's going to be the future that's, that's definitely needed isn't it because these, these guys are medical doctors they go through six years like everyone else does but they can't read squiggly lines which like, so why not have ai do that for you exactly or save the guys and then the nurses can do it or then the, you know do you mean you can literally have it why can't you know why can't you put that out to the local um, outreach nursing teams? That's something that we were looking at. You know, how do we get the leverage? Mm. Why are you storing that knowledge in the doctor's head? Doctors are really good at doing doctor stuff, but how can we take some of that and put that out and spread that around to other medical professionals? You know, M Pharma using pharmacists. You know, there's pharmacies around the place, far more pharmacists and doctors. They're hugely educated. You know, how can we mm. spread that knowledge around? I think that's where AI is going to come into it.
um, and be able to spread that around in different languages and upskill huge amounts of the population. But, you know, it's logistics when it comes down to it, a lot of it. So, Nick, of some of the stories that I've heard you over the years, sitting in the back of the classroom watching you speak, which is never boring, by the way, but one of my favorite stories is you and Tim Barrow being up on Mount Everest or the base camp, or where was it? They are doing an iron marathon. Tell me about that. So for those who don't know, Tim, he's a absolute fiend, very, very successful fiend now. I'm um, working um, with uh, sea locks, doing great things um, with blood clotting at the minute. Uh, but myself and Tim used to muck around quite a bit, and he ran a company doing event support that got offered this job to go to Ladakh up in the Himalayas um, for an X amount of time to do this. It's called La Ultra. So it's about 330 kilometers over three days across the three highest passes. Everything's over like 5,000 meters, 5,000 meters. <laughs> wow. Non-stop ultra. Get some of the best, best proper males of ultra males um, you know, if you're in that world. I do a lot of running, so I know what they're talking about. But like, these guys are absolutely, women, absolutely, like, absolute males athletes. Um, so yeah, so he said, Nick, do you fancy coming out? There's like many things and many good stuff. There's not much money in it. Didn't get anything from it really. But we said, right, but, but we need a, a couple of, we need 10 days or a week's acclimatization was written into the contract, which was happy days. So he just basically went out there and kicked about it for like 10 days, um, beforehand or a week beforehand in the mountains in the Himalayas. Um, as re- it's really, we flew into it as high, like it is. I've done, a, I've done a fair bit of altitude stuff, and it is as high. You get off the plane, you're like, mm. yeah, you walk up the stairs. It takes you a couple of days, um, which is, uh, yeah, so we went up there, and then we, it was an interesting, because there was nothing. They had no plan. We were there to do it. We were the consultants to do it. We managed to scrounge some gear with some mates, so we had two med bags, um, a decent amount of drugs, and then we did the usual thing is you tip up to your local pharmacy and go, right, I want this, 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 and this. And then you blag your way a load of decent medications and pain meds off the local pharmacist. Um, again, I don't know how legal it is, but that's just the way it works. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> we were like, so literally, but uh, yeah, you can get what you can get. You go, I want this. Like, I want carboxyphase. Well, you can't. You can have this, and okay, that's the same. Okay, I'll get that. You know, and that's that's where you have your wish list and you get what you get. Um, okay, I can't have this. What's the next best thing? And that's what you're going to do. On the, that's where you need to know your stuff to go out and do this stuff. Um, and you get you get what you can. And you, you know, we had to design this this support plan to these runners. It's on the main highways, you know. So it's running over the roads. So it's a road run. So there's massive trucks flying up and down these things at five and a half thousand meters. So as far as your risk profile goes, it's absolutely insane. So you've got high altitude first of all, um, massive roads with hugely. You know, they're running at night on these huge roads. Can get pancakes at any point in time. Um, it's on a, it's 300 kilometers so at any one point in time you've got races you've got runners spread across that entire stretch and there's two of us so how do you cut wow. um, and then you've got risk of risk of uh, severe hypothermia it's like minus 20 up at five and a half thousand meters at night and then it gets up to like 38 down in the lowlands so in the morning <laughs> you've got risk of hypothermic patients in the, in, the, in, in the afternoon they're all going down with heat stroke um, wow. so, and you've got your kit in your bag and it's going on for three days straight. Uh, so that, that was, that was the problem we were given to solve. Um, and as well, you, you have to put criteria in for when you pull these, these guys have spent a lot of money and time. You know what I mean? Like, and these, if you ever work for high level athletes, they don't like being told they can't do something. You know, they are the ultimate type A's. So it's working with them to make it a fun and achievable environment. You know, so you're looking at your risk. The, the best thing to do, you can look at risk is go, this is generally a bad idea, everyone. Let's can. <laughs> you should be like, is that realistic? We want to so, but you can't do that. It's what you're paid to do. Um, so then we, we put put in a, a reasonable, I mean, like a best effort, try to cover ourselves, cover the patients. You know, we have, uh, you know, an assessment, you know, brush up on your, 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 um, you know, your high altitude stuff. I mean, Tim had a great one where one of the guys, this guy is, I've still followed him now, this guy's an amazing guy. Um, guy from and uh, gnarly old sea captain type. And he was running up over one of these peaks, and Tim was driving behind him. And uh, you could literally hear him go, mm. you could hear him bubbling away in his lungs. So Tim is like, Jesus. Wow. You know, so we went up to him. And this, the deal of this race is it's not like the Marathon de Sable where you can get like two IVs and that. You know, this guy. If you put on oxygen, you were done. 
Yeah, that was it. You're done. So you have to be very aware of these guys. You put them on oxygen, they're at the race. You know, they've trained for how long for an hour. So it's like, right, and you put the sats on them. And I mean, uh, whatever, at five and a half thousand meters, the sats is a way, and it's minus whatever. Sats is a work of fiction. So basically the way you used to do it mm. is you look around and you'd, you'd find the healthiest looking bloke that you could find, put him in the car, chuck a sats in him, see what his was, and go, well, he looks all right on that. And then you'd test your patient. Because otherwise, mm. what's normal? You should be what's normal that far, you know, what a normal sats ratio is. Um, so a lot of it is quite interesting at that point. It's just kind of, but anyway, so Tim was buying this guy and the guy was like properly frightened. He's like, Jesus, look, mate, you, you got to really stop it. But he was on the down. And he was just like, look, mate, if you if you stop or you look any worse, I'm pulling you. But I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. You're on the down now. Like, he's still running, so it's not that bad. You know, but if you, hmm. you know, and then to be fair, the guy had like high altitude pulling redeemer and he jogged it off. <laughs> Wow. Literally, and it is that steep. And that's the thing. If anyone you've seen, I've done Kilimanjaro as well, I've like that and like that. And you see the evacuations out there. Guys will literally be like um like you're looking at them going, This is not good. this is not good. I did an evacuation off at once and you look at the guy and it's like, Jesus Christ, like, serious paperwork's coming my way. Um mm. and then you uh you get them down quick and you can literally see it. So the quicker you get them down, you can see him just sparking, you can see him waking up. And within, literally within 15 minutes, 20 minutes, they're just sitting there chatting to you from being effectively a mm. Um Like altitude is really, it's really interesting. But yes, yeah, so this guy, you know, jogs off. We know the stuff like, you know, putting in, how do you prepare a, a trauma, trauma bay, effectively, for where these guys are working these high risk, high, coming past high risk rows. So you spontaneous trauma bay to try and pick up anyone who's, um, who's, um, you know, being uh, been hit by a vehicle. Luckily, no one was. Um, there's other people who were there with DNV. You know, before the races, you got these athletes coming in, and they've they've spent their time acclimatizing. How do you do um, DNV? You know, want to get these mm. people ready to go. You know, put 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 some fluid into them. So it's really interesting from that sort of point of view. The altitude was was really into the effects of it. You know, you're looking at some of these runners and looking at the gate, looking at that mumbling, stumbling, fumbling, and that real broad brush, because mm. you can't pull them all the time. You're making clinical assessments on the go. So how you drive past someone and you make a bit of a, a working clinical assessment about how they're getting on um, globally before you wow. can pull them in. So it was really interesting. You, you did have to know that. Luckily, we were both of us new on business at that point in time. Um, well, kind of close enough to, to get it done and we're lucky nothing drastic happened um and there was a successful turnaround and we did some we wrote it so you can read about it actually in the um we published it in the remote medical wilderness the magazine for the wilderness medical mm. society i think it's still there um nice but yeah now yeah, it was, it was, some good jobs you can do but they're like far and few between you know that did some really good jungle expeditions that was really good um you know did a lot of costa rica and then i went off to borneo Ran that for a bit, um, medicking it over there. So there's some good things, you know, some Kilimanjaro's. Um, there's some good, good stuff that you can kind of do for a bit of a busman's holiday. Hmm. Unfortunately, there's the jobs that'll they'll put you in Basra with an AED and a manky bandage, and that's your your paramedic kit. Yeah, but I didn't. To be honest, I didn't mind them because nothing you can do, is it? I mean, that's the thing. Like, I, and this is the more equipment you have, the more remote medicine is sick, not sick. And it's something that I tell the lads, the most successful projects that, that I've been involved in putting in, ironically, have had the least amount of equipment because it's simple. Because you can't, you, you trust your gut a lot more. So you look at someone and all you have to do is, am I happy that there's no chance this guy's got something beyond my capabilities to handle? And if you have no equipment whatsoever, all you can do is do a good clinical history, a good clinical examination, and just make a simple decision, stay or go. Mm. And it, you know what I mean? And that, that to me is the essence of remote medicine. No remote medic project can you stay and make someone better. Even paramedics, you don't make someone better. You merely stop the dying process. And with remote medicine, that's what it's about, is recognizing when it's making that decision aggressively and early. Um, you know, I've been on offshore boats where, you know, X amount, 100 miles off Nigeria, I've made that call, you know, and gone, this guy's come up to me with a, a, a belly, not sure what's wrong with it, but there is a possibility this could be early stage something. And I turn the boat around. Now it ends up he wasn't, he got better. I turn the boat back around, it cost the company $2 million, but I'd do it again. Hmm. 
you know, and that and that is where you have minimal equipment, you just keep it simple. When you have all the equipment, you start getting in, you know, I've worked in places where we have full scope labs, you start getting a bit more, well, I'll do this and I'll do that. And I'll have a look at this. You know, should the guy stay or should he go? Can he do his job or not? Hmm. You know, are you happy that there's no nefarious thing going in there? Um, and that to me is the essence of, of really the remote side of the house is, is not getting cocky. And that's where just having an AED and a bag of bandages, you know, it simplifies matters. You can still be a excellent medic with a AED and a, and a manky bandage. You're right. It's it's your learning and your experience that that makes a difference. Yeah, it's your clinical assessment, good history, clinical assessment, and knowing left and rights. You know, I prefer to get someone out early. And it, most of the really negative outcomes that I've seen, luckily, I haven't been involved in many of them um, to deliver or to my knowledge. Um, but most of them have involved. Um, holding patients. I've never heard of any massive negative outcomes from getting rid of a patient, from moving them on. Mm. I, I, the bad stuff only happens when you hold on to them too long. The bad stuff doesn't really happen if you get rid of them too soon. You know, you get a bit of lip and a bit of something, but the, the only really, the really bad stuff happens from holding a patient too long and not recognizing early enough they need to go. Because if you're three days away from care, that patient's going to be three days worse down the line. Mm. And yeah, and that's that's the difference. And that's experience. Just looking at a patient and like, ooh, no, 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 he's got to go. I don't know why. I just he looks he looks poorly. So let's yeah. Uh, and you yeah. got to back it up. I mean, you can't just kind of like. Very rare will someone spend money. And this is it comes back to money commercially. Like you know, very rare will someone spend money in the commercial environment on, especially if they're like the captain or something like that. So there's got to be a reason. I'm because of this signs, and that's where you're you know, good clinical exam, a good patient history. You know, um, that's when that comes into it. Is like, I don't need to know what's wrong. I just need to know something's probably wrong with them. There's a good chance that something's probably wrong with them. Mm. Get rid and get them out. Um, because normally it takes a while as well. Yeah. Um, you know, you just, by the time you, if, if every med medical emergency plan that I'd saw that had helicopters was true, you wouldn't see the sun for helicopters flying around. <laughs> the sky would be freaking black with them. Do you know what I mean? It's fallacy. So, Nick Dillon, what advice would you have for a newly minted BSC paramedic, remote paramedic, or somebody who's just got their ALS ticket and they're on their their first or second deployment? I suppose it's like it's look at what additional bits you can offer. So, you know, you need to you need to continue your medical education. You, know, you do generally need to know medicine, obviously, um, but also look at you know it's not just. I always think that I mean, some of the best value I think that people can get is. Um, Force health protection officers, you know, these guys, so they're the ones that, that drain sniffers, rat catches. Um, but think about, if you think about an event happening, from the minute that person's gone down with deli belly or MI or whatever, asthma attack, whatever it is, that you're no longer in control of that. So that's when you're going to have to be really, really good, know your business, you know, dry drill all your skills, understand the different common things that happen, know your drugs, you know, be resourceful, understand your your pathways and uh, all that sort of stuff. But also be looking at, you, but it's not in your control after that. Don't lose focus of when you can still control it, which is prevention. You know, it's something that I think oil and gas is very good at. Um, it isn't necessarily transferred over into other areas. Um, you know, just just simple things as like don't lose focus on like doing the boring stuff about hand wash. No one likes to do hand washing lectures, like you know, but it'll save you an awful lot of work. You know, look at look at the mm. the, the food and, and and those aspects. Um, you know, look at screening, education, and that sort of things for your patient groups you know, and your response. It's something that you can bring to the table with your employer as well and go, look, I want to put this program in place health prevention and, and that sort of stuff um i do think that you should still obviously progress your your skill set don't lose touch with normal medicine um you know remote medicine is a subspecialty of medicine it's all the same thing you know what what's happening in hospitals effectively what you're going to be doing to your patients so you do still need to keep your clinical hours up you need to touch patients um, you need to have warm hands so it's very easy mm. to go on a job and you're month on, month off, six weeks on, so whatever, whatever your rotation is, um, and you don't see a patient. You go two years easy in this industry without seeing a patient from the wrong job. And I've spoken to people, well, you know, people come to me for work when their job's finished five years, zero patient contact. What, you know, what are you going to do? Mm. You've, you've pushed plastic once a year. 
make sure you, you make an effort to keep yourself current. Um, and that goes for any specialty. Mm. If you're a surgeon, you know, you still need to do actual, you know, you need, you need to get your hands, hands dirty at some point. Um, and then progress your education and don't just think linear. Don't do short courses. Look at university. You need your short courses. Yeah. But short courses run out. Look for something that gives you bang for buck. You know, like postgraduate education now, you can get a master's for four grand, six grand, you know, that'll see you the rest mm. of your life. Um, you know, that also aligns with a traditional look at making sure that something aligns with a traditional uh, medical system or you know, a normal hospital. Because you don't want to just be stuck in a remote environment. You want to, if you spend your money on a course or some education or do something, make sure that it is actually benchmarked against something in the real world as well. Because um, in 20 years, you don't know what you're going to need. Um, and mm. have an awareness about the, the broader, um, the business side of it and the, the commercial aspects. Um, most of the folks now that I sort of cut my teeth with, the guys like Tim and Al Bongarts and various other people around the world that I still kick around with, um, most of us have now moved out of, sort of the clinical delivery aspect. Some, some, some folks, guys and girls, mm. are still out there, you know what I mean, like, swinging cannulas around and tourniquets and you know what I mean really getting stuff done but a lot of us now have sort of shifted out and now in the, the operation management the project management the, the commercial aspect of it um, so you know that, that at some point you're going to plan for your future it's not something you can still be on the rigs at the age of whatever and it's cool you know brilliant um, but you know it's always good to have a, an out um, industries change you see in the oil and gas sector you know exploration that really fell down i mean there, there is effectively no offshore sector anymore um because mm. the exploration and so you're at the are you at the whim of you know hostiles got way better now so you know you, you know guys are making good money in ukraine initially now that's sort of calming down um for private sector i think there's a bit of africa sort of pulling up but you've got to be able to switch fire um and also have more than one string to your boat i always used to teaching when there was no work on um, I'd go and teach when you know there was no teaching on. I'd go and do some go and do some medic jobs, you know, um, and don't get stuck on day rates. They change job to job. Um, is the reality of it, and it's something that I find talking to people as well as well. Last time I was paid this, so a different contract, you know, and that's that's the thing. So if you get don't get, don't get awed by the um, by the you know you, the the legends of money out there. You know, there's the, you can make good money and you can make possible. I made a career of it for the family for X amount of years, 15, 20 years. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's not, you're a contractor, always have an out. Invest in yourself. For sure. Yeah. And that's what you put your money into. And it's something that, you know, most, most of the really successful folks around, if that's what they've done, you know, investing is something that gives you more than just a single ticket. That's the advantage of academia. It's transferable for those that get a BS in remote paramedic or like yourself, you're now doing an MBA. Well, you needed a bachelor's degree to get into the MBA, so it can could never really expire. Having all your your how many degrees? you got four or five degrees now, Nick, and and, and they're just never going to expire. Yeah, no, and, it's, and you get something from all, then it's you know you do something you're interested. At this point, you're doing stuff I'm interested in. But yeah, it's um, you know, I do. I say it quite often. Is if you look at what it is, there's some short tickets you need that just gives you for work. You know, you need your AC lessons and your PH lessons, or whatever. And, you know, suck it up. You've got to do them. Um, but you know, to to really pull you out. And, and folks these days, most people have a a degree. So, like, I mean, I you know, for for my just recently current job, um, you know, I'd look at CVs, hundreds of CVs, or whatever. Um, and a lot of people have um have degrees and. You know, that medicine is working, especially the uh, applied science, you know, paramedicine, nurses, clinical officers. Mm. You know, they all have degrees or diplomas in education in, in that area. I'm um, gone are the days of a collection of courses equaling a paramedic or a, a workable solution. Um, so certainly an academia will last forever. Everyone recognizes it. You can cash it in in multiple different ways. Um, and it gives you a broader skill set because it forces you to do stuff that you wouldn't necessarily have just done. Like you have to read a paper, you have to learn about public health, you have to learn about research that you might actually find that you, know, you quite enjoy it and it's beneficial to you in the long run. You have to learn how to write a document. Mm. Everyone has that, yeah. Um, you know, Word, you have to know how to create a Word document. Surprisingly, that's actually quite important in the real world. So it gives you, it gives you exposure to those sort of skill sets. So that's why I think academia is really, you know, really, really important. 
looks good, gives you a huge amount of skill set that you might not need now, but in five years' time, ten years' time, that might be hugely important. And there's a set path where you do your undergraduate, you go on to a postgraduate, you can go doctorate if you so wish. Um, you know, there's there's lots of avenues there. Um, and once you've done it once, it gets easier. Yeah, first one's always the hardest. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. So it's been great to talk to you, Nick. And I owe you a point. So we've got to figure out where we can meet up. <laughs> Come over to Dubai, Avery. I know you're not a man for the heat, though, are you? You're uh, Irish complexion. I right? enjoy the desert. No, Dubai is, is... I've been there a few times, and I've always been in a fetal position quite quickly. <laughs> but it is a nice part of the world. Yeah, yeah no, it's all right. It's in winter, but, it's all right. Um, I just ran the marathon yesterday, so I survived that. So you can survive that. Survive Jesus. I'll point that here. Yeah. Well, thanks for being a guest, and we look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, mate. Absolutely. This is the theme tune plays now, is it? I like that. This has been a presentation from the College of Remote and Offshore Medicine. If you would like to earn CTD credits for this podcast, you can join the Council of Members. Being a member of the college gives you free CTD credit free access for our virtual field guide and discounts on our e-learning courses. You can join the team on our college website at quorum.edu.mt.